Hey, welcome back. And in this section of the video series, we're going to be doing the last final touches of the 3D process and also just going through the render settings and getting ready to just bring this into Photoshop. So let's get started with this. So at this part of the process, we're pretty much done with the entire render. Like this could actually be passable as a finished render, but I still like to go through and just kind of make sure everything is perfect and how I need it to be for the final render. So um, as I mentioned before, when we were doing the other parts of the image, I have been trying to add just kind of like some subtle yellows and oranges throughout the image just to kind of break up some of that greenery, but not too much. So recently I modeled out this kind of like orange autumn larch tree, and I figured this would be a good kind of scene to try this out in. So I'm just trying to put this out in the distance, try out different areas. I think I only kept one of them in the distance though for the final image, the one on the right side, I believe. But yeah, I felt like that looked pretty good. And I'm just testing out some new assets as well throughout the rest of the scene. I'm about to zoom in on the floating island too, and just kind of do some kind of final detailing here, just trying out some of the small trees and possibly some like red kind of shrubs as well to add some more color there too. So generally when I'm doing this stage of detailing, what I like to do, I don't think I'm actually doing it in this part of the process for this render, but usually what I do is each of those squares that are on the composition guides, the rule of thirds, I will actually use a render region and crop out each of those squares individually. And normally I'll just detail those individual squares until they look perfect on their own. So I just stare at those until everything is right and it looks good just by itself. Then I move on to the next square and then the next one. And I just do that through the entire image. And once everything looks perfect, then I look at everything else together. And generally when you go through every single section individually like that and put all of your focus into making them look perfect, then when you show the rest of the image, it's gonna look great, super clean and exactly how you want it to be. So I didn't do it for this project, but I do it for most of my projects, especially if I'm doing a very, very heavily detailed scene where I want everything to be kind of in their own spot and perfect. So now I'm just going through messing with some of the color in some of those trees, seeing what kind of like different effects I can get because I do want some more color other than just green. So I'm trying out some like oranges and some reds and just trying out really what I can to break up some of this green color. All right, so I got the kind of final checks done in the 3D side of everything. In this project, I didn't actually have to do really all that much. I just had to kind of add a few things and just move a few things around and now it's Pretty much done. So for this section, I just want to cover just my render settings and how I get ready to just move this into the final stage of rendering and bring it into the post-processing section. So let me go through everything that I do here. So the first thing I always got to do when I'm just like getting ready to render is check the outliner because there's a lot of cases where, especially when you're working in big scenes where there's just tons of different objects, there's lots of times where I'll click render wait an hour and then check back at the finished render and there's like just some random object floating in space or like you know my default mannequin character is just like standing in the path still because i forgot to like turn off disable and renders but it was still turned off in the viewport so basically what i want to do is just go through and make sure everything is turned on or off that needs to be so i just scroll through and if i see like this right here is turned off in the viewport but turned on in the rendered view i make sure that's turned off and i just go through every single group and double check that every single time pretty much always necessary for me at least because even me doing this there's still lots of times where i still just miss things and i just accidentally still just render the wrong objects in the final render and then have to redo so this at least just saves you from most likely not having to redo a render all right so on to the next part Let's start with the render properties. So in this window right here. All right, so under render, I use optics denoising and then generally about a thousand samples for all of my still renders. So at least for a scene like this, where the lighting is just very clean and even, you could easily get away with something like 500, maybe even 300 samples, and it would probably look very similar. If you're doing like a scene like nighttime with a bunch of like point lights and heavy volumetrics, then you might have to go a bit higher on the samples. But I've kind of just always done a thousand samples for all of my renders. It always looks great. It gets rid of pretty much all of the noise in almost every case. And also when I click render on a still render, I generally just, I do this whenever I'm going to be doing something else anyways. So I don't mind having to wait a little bit longer for it to render out the extra samples just because 
I'll generally be like making dinner or something while I'm rendering out an image. So that's just why I do a thousand. I just want to make sure it gets rid of as much noise as possible. But yeah, you can easily go much lower than this. So that's generally what I do for that. Light paths, this can change depending on a few things. But generally, I don't really care about total, diffuse, glossy, or transmission. Default values for this is perfectly fine in most cases. Um, volumetrics, I want to do something at least five and above. So if I go less than five, the volume is just going to be a lot like it's, a, it's not as soft. There's not as many bounces on the volumetrics. I find above four, you rarely really notice much of a difference. I do five just to give it a little bit extra of a boost just in case. So transparent, this is pretty much the most necessary thing for like nature scenes like this because plant assets usually use a lot of like alpha and transparency. If you have zero samples on here, so zero, you're gonna see this just looks terrible. And if I go one, so as you can see a value of one, it looks a little bit better, but all of the assets are just black. And that's because the transparency isn't really working still. We're kind of seeing some of the leaf and plant colors, but like the parts that are supposed to be transparent are just showing up as black and not actually transparent. So you want to make sure this is quite a bit higher because, well, 250 is not necessary, but generally like 20 to 35 is where I go, but sometimes I have to go a bit higher depending on the scene. But this range is usually pretty good for transparent. So all of that pretty much default. Simplify, this just depends on what I need. So while working, sometimes I'll go on the texture limit to like, you know, this value sometimes around like 2K or 1K, just depending on the scene and how fast I want this to respond. Textures can take up a ton of memory and just slow down your system pretty easily. So generally I'll just go pretty low until it works as quickly as I need it to. Textures for scenes like this aren't really that important. Like generally with like heavy foliage scenes, you're not actually seeing any of the textures up close because as you can see, like the grass or like these shrubs, you're mostly just seeing color and not actual detail on the actual leaves themselves. So the texture resolution doesn't really matter too much. It's more so just the lighting and the color. So 512 to, you know, 2K or whatever you really need in the viewport is perfectly fine, of course. In render, I generally like to use about 2K for still renders, but for animations, I'll usually just bring this down to 1K just because you really won't tell the difference in most cases unless it's like an interior scene or something where you get like, you know, more visible up close textures that need to be high resolution. So I just do that so the animations render out just slightly faster because animations, of course, take quite a bit longer to render. Subdivisions and all of that generally just stays the same. And then AGX, sometimes I'll use Filmic depending on the lighting I need, but in a lot of cases, AGX does have some really nice kind of like contrast and just a nice look in general. Okay, so I think everything else is pretty much default there. So for my still renders, 4000 by 5000, this is a really good four by five aspect ratio and resolution. I like rendering out in really high resolution just because in post-processing, having a lot of just like resolution to work with, I feel like makes the editing process just much easier and cleaner to work with. But of course, 4000 by 5000 is a very large resolution to render out. So if you do have a slower system, you can also just type in 4000 by 5000 and then just limit the percentage to whatever you want. So yeah, four by five is what I use for pretty much all of my portrait posts though. So in here, the render passes that I use are the combined pass, which is this basically just everything, um, mist, volume direct and ambient occlusion. So I'll go over this in just a second when I go to the compositor, but these are just the passes that I have enabled in most of my scenes. Okay, so compositing, let's move over here. So this is my my general setup for my compositor. So I have these file outputs, which these are connected to image, mist, volume direct, and then AO. So all of the passes that I export, I have a file output set for these. And what a file output does is it just allows you to, well, if you open this, you can link whatever folder you want it to export to automatically. So if I'm rendering out an image, it's going to render, composite, and then automatically save to whatever folder you choose here. So you can see right here, I just have mist selected right here, volume direct selected right here. So you just basically choose the folder, the name you want, and then it's just going to automatically render out and then export with that name to the folder you choose. 
So this just saves a lot of time, especially if you're animating too. Um, you know, you can just animate, click render, and then it's just going to render to whatever place you specify here with all the passes organized by whatever name you choose. All right, so lens distortion. I use this pretty minimally, but it does produce a pretty nice effect. So here, let me open this. So dispersion right here is going to give you kind of that chromatic aberration. So if you kind of zoom in over here, you can see we start getting this kind of like red, blue, and green outline. And it kind of blurs out just a little bit on the corners like this. So that's what the dispersion does. I try to use a very minimal value. You can raise this if you like that look, but I try to go very subtle just because I don't like to overdo those types of effects. So I try to just keep those as low as I can while still you know, producing a really nice look. And then denoise, this is the denoise uh, node just because volume direct comes out noisy. So I just denoise after rendering just to clean up the volume pass and make sure that it's, you know, not all grainy and producing like ugly artifacts. So yeah, my compositing setup is very simple. Um, I basically, they basically just turn out looking like the normal, you know, render that you see in the viewport. So that is my entire render setup. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to NVIDIA Studio's YouTube channel so you can stay tuned for their new videos. And the next video in this series is going to be the final video, and that's going to cover the post-processing. So we're going to take this into Photoshop, and I'm just going to show you how I post-process an image like this and get the final result that you see here.